as one of the college students, to be honest, it's an unfamiliar topic in Indonesia's architectural curriculum. But that's the point. Us committees really hope that this topic and the material that will be presented in this webinar will give each one of us, not only participants, but the committees, MC and speakers, a new useful knowledge. Last but not least, I want to thank all the participants' enthusiasm who have registered and joined the Zoom meeting, the speakers and MC who have spared their time to participate, participate in this webinar, the committees who have brilliantly and tirelessly worked hard for months, and also Roman Keramics who have supported and sponsored our web webinar. This webinar will then run and be success successful without each one of you. That's all for my speech. Without further ado, let's get right into the web webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Stella Hari. Next, our first speaker will be Mr. Hari Mufrizan. Is Mr. Hari already in the room? Yeah, uh, already here. Okay, I will Hi. introduce to the participants about Mr. Hari Mufrizan. Mr. Hari Mufrizan is the principal architect from PT Rumah Kutai Perencana, who was graduated from Universitas Pancasila with a bachelor's degree and taking architecture masters at Universitas Indonesia. Mr. Hari has a bunch of experience in architecture and construction field. Without further ado, please welcome Mr. Hari Mufrizan. The floor is yours. Okay, uh, thank you, Fatma. Uh... Selamat siang semua. Uh, sorry. Uh, beberapa sudah saya kenal di sini. Saya ingin bahasa saja ya. Karena ini ada Pak Willy. Seperti saya kenal sama beliau ini. Saya sapa dulu sebentar beberapa teman saya yang saya kenal ya. Kayaknya Pak Willy saya kenal nih. Pernah ketemu. Uh, Pak Harbayu juga. Uh, kecu uh, tanpa kecuali ya Mr. Petrov ya. Pak Petrov. Saya sapa dulu beberapa teman yang namanya mungkin sudah muncul di sini nih. Saya tadi sembari melihat-lihat beberapa teman. Oke. Okay. Baik, uh, saya mulai. Saya share ya. Ini sudah bisa terlihat dengan baik? Sudah, Pak. Oke. Okay. Baik, terima kasih uh, pada literasi. Ya, ini uh, komunitas yang menarik karena berusaha untuk uh, belajar arsitektur dengan belajar membaca. Nah, pada hari ini saya akan mencoba me, ya, mempresentasikan sedikit aja ya, sebuah basic knowledge in architecture, jadi uh, arsitektonik. Nah, di sini uh, secara umum, Oh, sorry, saya salah memakai. Ah, oke. Okay. Sorry, salah memakai background. Mohon maaf, backgroundnya banyak. Image, mana background? Sebentar. Sudah tepat backgroundnya? Sudah ya? Benar ya? Oke, okay, terima kasih. Ya, terlalu banyak background jadi begini. Ya, uh, tadi sampai mana kita ya? Oke, okay, sini. Ya, uh, ini uh, mungkin bagi beberapa teman, bagi beberapa, uh, apalagi di sini ada arsitek-arsitek senior, mungkin ini enggak, uh, enggak terlalu berat lah ya. Ini cuma pengantar untuk ke arah uh, nanti pembicaraan dari Mr. Petrov. Ya, jadi arsitektonik, basic knowledge in architecture ini uh, spesial diberikan kepada uh, literasi, ya, sekelompok anak muda yang senang arsitektur uh, dan bisa membaca arsitektur itu seperti apa. Ya, material dari saya sebenarnya cukup simpel aja yaitu tentang plato tektonik itu tentang rupo tektonik dan Indonesia seperti apa kemudian ya seperti standar bergerak ke primitif hat untuk sebagai bentuk awalnya kemudian 
kita coba cari dasar-dasar uh, dari Indonesia seperti apa. Kemudian mengembangnya seperti apa. Plato tektonik itu apa sih? Nah, ini mungkin ini arsitek agak unik karena kita harus uh, kita harus tahu juga tentang uh, ilmu yang lain. Ini tentang geodesi ya. Jadi ini geomorfologi ya sebuah proses pembentukan muka bumi. Nah, nanti di ilmu ini kalau nggak salah ada interior bumi yaitu belajar tentang lapisan bumi. Nah, ini eksteriornya di, di arsitektur kita belajar tentang eksterior dan interior. Nah, sekarang kita belajar tempat kita menapak itu di mana sih kita menapak di eksterior dari sebuah bumi. Nah, bentuk muka bumi ini ternyata mereka pakai istilah morfotektonik ya. Jadi eh, pembentukan geomorfonya dengan neotektonik. Jadi setiap ada pergerakan muka bumi sehingga eh, muka bumi itu selalu berubah ya. Kalau di sini mereka sebut sebagai landscape evolution. Eh, kalau kita lihat mungkin dari sisi yang lain bahwa bumi itu selalu mencari keseimbangan sehingga ketika mencari keseimbangan tersebut ketika ada satu letusan di satu titik pasti di, diikuti oleh pergerakan di titik yang lain apakah itu secara tektonik atau vulkanik jadi eh, saya melihat bahwa eh, ini adalah dasar tempat kita bergerak atau dasar arsitek eh, rancang ya kemudian kita ngeliat Indonesia sendiri ya kita nggak jauh-jauh kita lihat Indonesia ternyata Indonesia itu terbentuk dari Uh, ring of fire dalam artian uh, ring of fire itu uh, cincin cincin uh, api ya ya di sini uh, sirkum pasifik yang selalu kita kenal uh, yang paling sering kena gerakan uh, vulkanik dari sirkum pasifik atau ring of fire adalah dari uh, uh, Jepang jadi sirkum pasifik itu bisa dibilang di arah sebelah uh, Timur Indonesia. Sedangkan sebelah barat Indonesia ini sebagai sirkum Mediteran ini lebih banyak arah gunungan. Jadi ini akibat lipatan uh, vulkaniknya. Kemudian ternyata ada lagi tektonik plate. Tektonik plate itu adalah uh, lempeng bumi. Ini yang sempat uh, kemarin yang ketika kita terjadi gempa atau terjadi tsunami di Aceh, nah itu akibat dari pergerakan lempeng bumi. Nah, ternyata inilah uh, dua hal yang selalu menjadi uh, landasan bagaimana uh, arsitektur awal di Indonesia bergerak. Kalau kita baca di literatur. Nah, kalau ini adalah beberapa jenis gunung yang ada di Indonesia, ya. Jadi yang sebelah kanan ini adalah sebagai sirkum uh, Pasifik, sebelah kiri adalah sirkum Mediteran, ya, uh, terutama di uh, Pulau Sumatera. Nah, eh, yang memang ring of fire ini lebih aktif. Kenapa disebut of fire? Eh, kenapa api? Karena memang pegunungan aktif. Eh, terakhir kita ingat eh, yang di Hawaii, ke gunung yang meletus sehingga menghabiskan satu pulau, nah itulah yang terjadi. Kemudian jika teman-teman nonton film Moana, mungkin ya, nah itu juga menarik. Tuh. Itu juga bercerita sebenarnya tentang bagaimana pembentukan pulau-pulau tersebut eh, dan mereka bercerita itu sebagai nenek moyangnya dan uh, sehingga di situ kita bisa melihat bahwa ada sebuah budaya yang sangat terkait dengan uh, gunung berapi. Nah kemudian kalau dikoneksikan ke arsitektur seperti apa ya kita baca aja sih sedikit Heidegger gitu ya. Uh, ini nanti kita nggak uh, usah berteori banget tapi Heidegger cuma bilang bahwa kata-kata uh, teknik, tekne itu memang berasal dari kata uh, asal katanya teks dari bahasa Yunani yang berarti art, art handicraft atau apapun gitu yang sesuatu yang muncul ya. Nah eh, ini eh, jadi landasan kadang-kadang eh, ketika kita di kampus sebagai mahasiswa arsitektur eh, untuk memahami eh, arti kata arsitektur dan arsitektur. Nah kemudian ada satu lagi yang suka sering disebut-sebut di eh, dunia pendidikan arsitektur. The Primitive Hut dari Logier. Ini juga bercerita tentang eh, dalam tanda petik rumah dasar atau rumah paling pertama itu yang apa sih? Gitu. Nah ini saya sempat juga jadi teringat eh, ini kalau bercerita tentang rumah paling dasar itu eh, mungkin ada teman-teman yang 
mungkin di sini juga ada tentang Prof Gunawan Cahyono saya ingat banget beliau bilang rumah paling dasar kita itu ketika kita hujan kita menadahkan tangan kita di kepala itu sudah sebagai sebuah arsitektur dan sebagai sebuah eh, lingkungan karena kita sudah berusaha untuk melindungi diri itu yang terjadi. Nah eh, kemudian dari ini logjer ini kan lebih ke arah filsafatnya atau gimana karena kita tidak pernah melihat Uh, primitif hat dari si logjer ini. Tapi kemudian memang ada beberapa uh, peneliti ya di sini salah satunya Mark Jarzombek ya ini saya ambil dari Architecture of First Societies sebagai sebuah global perspektif. Ini uh, banyak dia di buku ini banyak memperlihatkan beberapa bentuk dari rumah-rumah uh, dasar atau uh, primitif hat. Tapi sudah ada konstruksi dan strukturnya yang yang uh, menyesuaikan dengan lingkungan alam. Kalau contoh ini ini adalah Pony Dance House. Ini seperti rumah mungkin kalau teman-teman suka nonton apa yang tiga boneka lucu itu uh, Teletubbies ya. Ini juga jadi rumah itu kayak dipendang. Jadi setengahnya itu ada di dalam tanah atau ada ada dibikin gundukan kemudian Uh, dia bikin sebuah uh, tutupan di atasnya. Dan satu lagi juga uh, dia tidak dia tidak membuat dengan tidak membuat dengan uh, gundukan, tapi materialnya yang berbeda. Kalau yang pertama materialnya adalah uh, tatalan kayu, ya pipihan kayu atau kulit kayu untuk penutup. Tapi yang kedua ini uh, masih tetap memakai kulit, tapi uh, di sini sudah memakai kulit uh, binatang. Dan kita bisa melihat bahwa bentuk dasarnya rata-rata uh, adalah melingkar. Dan memang uh, First Societies di Mark Jarzombek ini juga memperlihatkan bahwa bentuk dasar bangunan uh, primitif hat itu rata-rata dari hasil peninggalannya itu memang berbentuk melingkar. Nah, ini ada satu lagi. Ini bambuti ormbuti ya itu reforest di Kongo. Ini hard construction ya dan memang akhirnya bentukan dasarnya membulat ya. Nah memang uh, ini nanti disesuaikan dengan uh, alam setempat. Kemudian bagaimana dengan di Indonesia? Nah ini kebetulan uh, ini teman-teman uh, di kampus Universitas Pancasila melakukan semacam Koka itu apa ya? Jadi kuliah ke apa? Kuliah ke, ke berkunjung ke sebuah tempat, kemudian mencoba mencari tahu tentang arsitektur lokal seperti seperti apa. Ini kemudian bangunan yang ada di Ogan Kemerling dulu, ya. Ini bentukan dasar seperti ini. Jadi agak beda ketika ini disandingkan dengan punya si Jar uh, Zombek yang melihat dari uh, First Society. Ini sudah lebih lanjut, lebih lengkap karena arsit, bukan hanya arsitektur, karena cara berarsitekturnya sudah lebih komplit terutama strukturnya ya. Jadi meruangnya juga lebih banyak, gitu ya. Kemudian sudah membentuk uh, uang, uh, membentuk uang uh, publik seperti itu. Ini arsitekturnya kita bisa melihat bahwa mas, memang rata-rata uh, bangunan di Indonesia uh, merupakan bangunan panggung. Ya, cuma di sini sudah terjadi perubahan yang uh, signifikan, yaitu umpaknya sudah tidak memakai lagi uh, batu alam. Jadi dia sudah umpaknya sudah di beton ya. Nah ini bahkan sudah tidak ada umpak, tapi sudah menapak ke uh, ke uh, tanah langsung kemudian dicor beton. Jadi ini adalah perubahan-perubahan dari sisi arsitektural yang sudah terjadi. Nah ini uh, detail. Uh, Tolong diabaikan uh, ini ya uh, 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 rumah biliarnya itu tolong diabaikan. Saya juga nggak ngerti kenapa ada di situ ada uh, meja biliar. Tapi kita bisa melihat bahwa di sini masih menggunakan uh, kayu utuh. Sama seperti ketika uh, tadi jar zombek, semua adalah dari alam. Jadi ini adalah kayu utuh, uh, lingkaran sebesar itu digunakan langsung. Kemudian cara menyambungnya pun juga masih sangat uh, sederhana. Ya, dicoak sedikit, dimasukkan gitu. Tidak uh, arsitektur yang wood joinery yang sudah sangat uh, kompleks. Wow. 
ini di dalam bangunan kita bisa ngeliat bahwa e, ternyata bangunan yang sangat tinggi ya ini bangunan awal sangat tinggi ternyata ini ruang dalamnya itu rendah ya ruang dalamnya sangat rendah seperti ini nah ini ada e, sambungan kayu juga e, terlihat di beberapa titik mereka semua menggunakan kayu ini posisi dari e, atap ya konstruksi atap ini sudah memang sudah sangat uh, baru karena sudah menggunakan uh, genteng juga ya. Nah ini adalah uh, tangga detail tangga seperti ini bisa kita lihat sambungan kayu juga masih dimasukkan ke dalam uh, kayu apa uh, anak tangganya dimasukkan ke induk tangganya buka gitu ya. Kemudian ambang pintu juga ditinggikan sedikit ya sehingga untuk masuk ke ruang itu ada hierarkinya. Ya, kita bisa melihat beberapa detail arsitektur yang eh, akhirnya eh, jadi menarik karena didetailkan dan diberikan pikiran. Tapi beberapa bangunan ini karena masih eh, rumah sangat simpel, rumah sangat dia tidak menggunakan lagi detail-detailnya. Eh, nah ini di Pulau Sumatera. Terus bagaimana dengan di Jawa? Nah ini yang paling sering kita lihat, ya. Nah ini kebetulan. Saya terlibat dari sebuah kegiatan rantai rakyat rumah Joglo. Ini juga sebuah komunitas menarik. Di sini ternyata yang namanya rumah tradisional itu bisa dibongkar pasang. Yang berarti rumah ini pun juga bisa dibongkar pasang selama dia tidak menggunakan sambungan yang diikat dengan kaku. Selama dia diikat dengan kayu atau dengan teknik menyambung kayu, berarti dia bisa dilepas pasang kembali. Ini contoh dari uh, Joglo House, rakyat, rakyat rumah Joglo. Di sini uh, saya belajar uh, di kelompok ini untuk bagaimana me merakit kembali rumah Joglo ya, tanpa ada kesalahan atau tanpa ada uh, ya, tanpa ada kesalahan pasti ya, tapi juga tanpa ada sambungan dengan paku sama sekali. Tapi uh, yang menarik adalah ini dia, ini nih, dia pakai pasak-pasak yang sudah disiapkan. Nah, ini teknik sambungnya. Jadi kita lihat, ini saya sengaja ambil satu jenis sudut aja. Ini tadi sudut yang awal, tanpa ada, belum ada koneksi yang di luarnya, jadi ini masih joglo awalnya nih. Kemudian masuk ke pinggirannya, ini belum tersambung antara bangunan pinggiran dan bangunan tengahnya. Nah, ini ketika sudah tersambung. Jadi ini semua sambung uh, dengan tanpa uh, uh, paku. Dan ini yang mungkin kalau teman-teman sini sering dengar dengan istilah uh, jantan betina ya. Nah ini dia contohnya menyusunnya seperti ini. Ya ini sudah tersusun. Ini di bagian uh, joglo utamanya. Ini ketika memasang ya kita bisa melihat bahwa ada sekian lapis yang bisa disusun berdasarkan uh, besaran dari masing-masing uh, rumah joglo tersebut. Nah, yang menarik dari tetap dari sebagai sebuah rumah tradisional pasti ada sesuatu yang di uh, apa istilahnya diukir ya di, dijadikan uh, penanda. Nah, ini salah satu penanda. Kemudian ini juga salah satu sambungan yang dibuat uh, tampilannya lebih beda. Ini ketika pemasangan, eh, nih, ketika pemasangan eh, kaki kuda-kudanya seperti ini, ya. Nah, dari situ eh, kami kemudian coba belajar untuk bagaimana me mencoba menerapkan eh, sambungan kayu tersebut ke eh, bangunan kayu yang lainnya. Ini uh, beberapa contoh uh, ketika mengembangkan sambungan kayu tersebut. Yang paling kiri adalah sambungan kayu yang paling sederhana, kemudian yang tengah uh, kolomnya itu sudah full pakai kayu, kemudian dirangkum jadi uh, jadi satu gitu ya. Kemudian yang sebelah kanan ini mencoba kalau bentuknya jadi agak beda. Bagaimana jadinya gitu ya? Apakah dia masih lebih kuat atau dia bisa uh, lebih uh, stand lebih baik? Nah, kemudian dari hasil pengamatan tersebut, 
uh, ini juga saya juga coba melakukan sesuatu yang uh, terkait dengan uh, sambungan tapi ini dengan metal material bagaimana kalau misalnya rumah tersebut disusun dari susunan metal ini saya coba membuat ini ini juga bagian dari kegiatan di kampus Universitas Pancasila kemarin nah, kemudian dia bisa disusun jadi uh, beberapa masa bangunan ya tapi yang paling penting dari sini adalah uh, tektoniknya itu adalah ketika bagian mana membuat jenis sambungan yang uh, bisa dipakai untuk di semua titik jadi uh, kami waktu itu saya dengan satu orang teman sipil mencoba menciptakan atau bukan menciptakan mendesain tradisain gitu hanya dengan dua jenis titik sambungan itu kita bisa menyambung semua jenis uh, kebutuhan sambungan di uh, sebuah bangunan sederhana seperti ini ya jadi kita bisa melihat bahwa yang merah ini sama dengan yang biru ini sebagai sebuah bentuk uh, unit penyambung Saya rasa cukup eh, sebagai pengantar aja supaya bisa masuk ke Mr. Petrov supaya yang lebih apa lebih konkret sebagai eh, bentuk tektonik di arsitektur. Terima kasih. Thank you, Mr. Hari. It was a very precise and relevant presentation. I'm pretty sure all the participants now more understand about tectonics. Next and architecture, and this will be correlated with the next presentation with our next speaker. Now we have come to another main agenda, webinar session by the second speaker, Mr. Svetlin Petrov. I will introduce to the participants about Mr. Svetlin Petrov. Mr. Svetlin Petrov is an architect and designer who is taking a master degree at the University of Tokyo and the University of Architecture in Bulgaria. Mr. Svetlin Petrov has various working experiences in Jakarta, Japan, and Bulgaria. In 2023, the latest award he received was an award from the Kagawa Architecture Award as a part of Koso Tokyo team. Is Mr. Svetlana Patrov already in the room? Yes, hello. Okay, I bet he is. Hello. Okay, I'll pass the time now to Mr. Svetlana Patrov. The floor is... Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Do you hear me okay? Is my microphone okay? Yes, it's audible. Okay, okay. Thank, clear, you. Sir. thank you, thank you. Let me try to share my screen. Just a moment. Do you hear it properly? Do you see it properly? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for uh, having me today. Uh, this is a very interesting and personal topic for me, although I'm not an expert at all on architectural tectonics. It has been something that interested me for a long time. Uh, just one more time to introduce myself. My name is Svetlin Petrov, and I'm an architect, and I'm based uh, here in Indonesia as part of Koso Japan. Um, regarding today's talk, uh, I was very uh, kind of, uh, I was struggling to figure out how to name it. What, what should be the main question that we're going to try to answer as part of this uh, title of the webinar? And I'm very happy that pa Hari talked about uh, plate tectonics in the beginning of this uh, conversation, because I think that uh, architect, uh, there is something very interesting to think about when you're talking about what is shaping architecture. I believe that actually there are quite a few forces in uh, like during the architectural design 
in construction which shape what an architectural work can be. And I was thinking that in nowadays that we have all kinds of technologies and we can do any shape or any design. Uh, sometimes maybe we forget um, where architecture comes from or, or, or maybe where architecture uh, arises from. So I was thinking, let's see if we can discuss maybe that today. So today's presentation, I uh, is divided more or less into three parts. Uh, I would want to briefly share my background because this is something that really led me to my interest in this topic. I would like to present a little bit what COSO actually is, what is our office and how do we approach design. And finally, perhaps our take on tectonics. And uh, it's a very nuanced issue, but perhaps we, we, we can have like a, a one opinion uh, and uh, to, to kind of back that up, uh, I can prepare a couple of examples from our practice. So firstly, uh, a little bit about myself. Uh, I started to become interested in architecture during my high school because I, I was in a vocational high school for building in architecture. And that uh, really very much uh, kind of arose my interest in how buildings are built. And during my time studying architecture and working in various offices in Bulgaria, I was mainly focused and very interested to understand detailing, to understand construction techniques, to understand basically how buildings work. Uh, concept was very important for me, but I actually really wanted to know how do we build something properly and then how does this affect architecture? So my first master's degree back in Bulgaria was on architectural uh, construction techniques and on detailing. But after that, uh, I decided to move to Japan to continue research and a uh, very long kind of uh, passion of mine was uh, wood, wood architecture, contemporary wood architecture. In Bulgaria, we have a lot of wood architecture, but it's historical. I wanted to know what is architect well, architecture made of wood in, uh, in 20, 21st century. And that was a very interesting journey because working with wood is not the same as many other materials. Wood is a very particular material. It, uh, you really have to kind of follow its qualities in order to produce something because it, get eaten by termites easily, get rots easily, changes color easily, burns, all of those things. So in a way, while I, while I approached my research in the beginning to understand uh, build uh, wood structures, I actually realized that respecting the qualities of the material uh, directly affects how architecture uh, is realized, how it looks like, how it functions, so on. So while I was doing that, uh, my professor there in, uh, in Japan actually had very many varied interests. So he introduced me through the research of wood architecture to other things which are less technical in architecture, such as uh, the impact of architecture on society, of society on architecture, how culture affects architecture, how geography affects architecture, climate. So then I realized that actually my original view on architecture was quite limited. And by expanding this kind of view, I realized that actually this is more or less uh, covering a lot of the forces and necessities to create architectural work. And in, uh, after graduating in Japan, I started working at COSO Japan in 2017. And then in 2021, I moved to Jakarta so we can establish uh, a small office here. What is COSO? Koso actually comes from the word kukan koso, that is our name in Japanese. This means uh, spatial concept. And the founder of the office is uh, Yushiki Kawazoe. He is the principal architect back in Japan, and he is a professor at the University of Tokyo. Uh, he has won a number of awards and written a number of books on architecture. And if I have to synthesize kind of our approach or the way I was trained by Kawazoe-san in uh, Japan to work, is to have sensitivity of place, to have sensitivity to the material, and then to really respect collaboration because architecture is not one man thing. There are so many people involved and then their input to some extent informs the architectural idea. So collaboration was something very, very important for us. And that is how we approach every project that we do, no matter if it's commercial or something else. 
So tectonics, uh, pa Harry already uh, talked a little bit about the Greek uh, origin of the word. Uh, tecton actually uh, is an uh, artisan, craftsman, carpenter, woodworker, builder, and as Paul explained, techne is uh, to create something. So this uh, uh, really implies that the tectonic architecture is one that uh, includes or involves artisans and craftsmen into the creation of architecture, or at least to me that is. And going back to our uh, kind of values on collaboration in design, um, you, a lot of our design often is informed by the contractor, by the construction company, but all by all our partners. So I always feel that this is an important thing to uh, make sure that everyone's contribution is visible. And if we have to just uh, make a very, very small introduction on tectonics, uh, or at least how we interpret it is, uh, so maybe 150 years ago or so, when the Western world started reevaluating ancient Greek architecture, uh, there was this uh, conversation that every architecture has its current form and its kunst form. And the current, current form is the one that is uh, the, the one that is the functional. So for instance, if it's a column, it's going to have a certain shape to convey gravity or the pressures of gravity. And that's going to inform how it's going to look like, basically. But then when you want to create, make it into an artwork, you a kind of ornament it or uh, emphasize it by uh, kind of uh, uh, highlighting the important points where, where, for instance, gravity is flowing. So this is at the top of the column, this is at the bottom of the column, and then those are kind of the slits around the column which show the direction of gravity. So in a way, the artwork follows the functional uh, shape. And then uh, when modernism came, um, there was uh, this another very interesting uh, discussion on tectonics, which I think very much connects to uh, Harris' uh, conversation with the hub, because uh, the Bauhaus, the first, the basically the establishing modernists, when they organized their school curriculum, if you look at this wheel, at the center of the curriculum is the building itself, is the building, the side, the uh, kind of the, the the act of building, the process of building. And to get to there, you have to understand the materials, you have to understand the way the materials are treated. So in a way, the architect is not just a conceptual person which creates an idea and someone else builds it, but the architect is the one who understands how things are built and it collaborates with everyone to do it. So I thought this is a very interesting uh, thing to find out because uh, since Bauhaus was founded, there's so many uh, kind of a modernist movements, which I think has really di diverted from that and had forgotten a little bit the origins of this. And then when I was uh, looking at those things, I was thinking, uh, so tectonics is not really so much, a, uh, in my opinion, of course, tectonics is not so much a aesthetic or like a uh, per se, just making a building and then showing how gravity flows through it. But rather, it's an approach to how do one architect uh, or team of architects takes an abstract idea that they have for a building and builds it into the place. So, uh, with the risk of super duper overly simplifying things, I thought maybe there's two kind of main approaches to do something. Of course, it's a spectrum between them, and I'm not saying that any approach is wrong. I'm just uh, thinking. If, I, if I'm thinking from my perspective of, of tectonics or the way we approach architecture, what are the options? So one way, for instance, is for us to take an abstract idea, which is this circle, and then just move it to the side and then create this exact object. And whatever influence is there, we resist it. We just create this exact perfect idea that we have in our heads, which I think sometimes is the way people think architects work. People think that we make an idea, which is an yes idea, then we put it there, then it's done. And perhaps sometimes it works like that. Perhaps sometimes this is the goal. Uh, but this kind of approach, which I would call the purist approach, I think is rather more rare. And I think depending on the situation, perhaps not as quote unquote tectonic. But I thought there is another approach to translating ideas to architectural objects. 
uh, now call that the progressive approach. Progressive because during the course of the project, many things are going to influence this idea and the idea is going to change into something. So uh, there are so many things that are going to affect how a building is going to be created. This is the place, the construction system, the timeline, the law of the place, the budget, the climate, the client's wishes or uh, like doubts, material, uh, material availability in this place, structural engineering, all of those things, natural forces like wind and earthquake. And buildings in the past uh, where uh, everything is very scarce and we don't have the technology to build just whatever, actually had to apply, uh, uh, how to say, conform to all of those things. And that uh, uh, in the end, their shape, their architecture became uh, what those pre those pressures towards the architectural idea are. So I was very uh, interested to kind of uh, think about that because in a way, the way we have designed so far in Koso and the way we uh, I have been taught to work is kind of to try to respect all of those things or try to anticipate them. And in the beginning of the idea, to already have an idea that is close to this kind of deformed object, which is going to appear because of all of those pressures. So this is more kind of like a process approach rather than just making an artwork and putting it out there. So to kind of try to illustrate that, of course, this is kind of a pure, pure idea, pure uh, kind of scenario. Uh, to try to illustrate that, I have collected a couple of our projects and to some degree, they are, have been done in this uh, kind of method, if I may say so. So to start with, I uh, first will show a couple of uh, architectural projects, a couple of buildings that we have done uh, and public spaces uh, that to some extent uh, work in this way. This is a, a visitor center for uh, open air museum in uh, uh, southern Japan. Uh, actually, the museum is this whole mountain here because it's in the forest. It's an architectural museum for houses for southern Japan. And our uh, project is actually this gray kind of roof down in the bottom of the mountain. On top, in the, on the top of the mountain is uh, Tadawando's uh, architecture. So that shows that Tadawando is way above our architecture. So uh, this is uh, what in the end res uh, resulted the visitor center. Uh, it's just a small building around 300 square meters. And it was very important to create a face for the, for the museum because the museum was rebranding, but at the same time to respect the traditional uh, kind of approach and the traditional architectural styles there. So we opted for a very low, very simple roof, uh, reminiscent structure of uh, traditional Japanese houses in this area. But we deformed it in, uh, in a way to create uh, uh, a little bit of uh, signifiers where people would go to, to emphasize function through the roof itself. And uh, the colors, the landscape that uh, we employed together with another architect, uh, design office actually I... was invoking this uh, Japanese way of building things on top of stone and there is a mud wall and then on top we have a wooden roof. So it's a very contemporary architecture actually, but uh, it really conforms to very simple traditional ways of building. So for instance, the roof is a three-dimensional kind of contemporary shape but actually it is made out of very, very simple wooden beams connected with very, very simple wooden rafters with cheap material on top of uh, plywood. This is uh, dictated because uh, the budget was not very high. So it had to be creative rather with joinery, with textures rather than with expensive materials. Uh, for instance, if you see here in the, uh, in the uh, picture to the right, where we are inside the visitor center, this is a very, very simple structure. Uh, that uh, almost follows the proportion of traditional Japanese architecture, but at the same time, it has its own character because of the local materials, local textures that you're using. The wood is local, uh, for instance, the um, stone that you're using for the landscape is local. So all of those things, they apply pressure to our original idea and then they form this architecture. 
Uh, one interesting thing here is, for instance, this kind of screen to the west that you're seeing on the facade. This is made out of a historic building, which is cut into very small pieces to create this facade to sh shield us from the sun. Uh, and at the same time, it tells us a story uh, for uh, from the client side because that was a client's request to incorporate this old material into the building. So all of those uh, things actually shape budget, timeline, the local place shaped architecture. And on the completely opposite side of Japan and the opposite side of the spectrum, we have this commercial architecture that you did in Tokyo, which is in the very, very center of Tokyo. So very dense, very intense place. Real estate prices are extremely high. So not so much budget left for architecture. We are using very small plots. So for instance, this is a uh, just five by 15 meter side, but the building is 40 meters high. So because of earthquake laws and everything, all of the budget needs to go to structure. So this already shapes our architecture. And then we have to be creative how we are using volumes. So one thing, for instance, is we are connecting the building to the street through these stairs to extend the street all the way up to the third floor. We are using, for instance, uh, concrete, very cheap concrete panels, but we flip them on the opposite side where they have texture. So then in this way, they became much more rustic, much more alive, while not changing the budget at all. And in that way, we also are blending into the existing neighborhood, which has this kind of a little bit grungy uh, bar feel. And so again, if we go into another extreme, where we go, for instance, to high-end hospitality, this is a traditional Japanese hotel on the uh, um, uh, Japanese sea in northern Japan. So here, for instance, uh, Japanese sea is extremely cold and salty. So any architecture you build is going to degrade immediately. So the only architecture you can create there is concrete. So the, when the team was working on that, they basically have to create a Japanese hotel, which is traditional, but they have to use concrete and basically create a bunker so uh, it can survive on this coast. But because, so that uh, the basically nature drives our idea and it tells us what to use. And no matter if it's concrete, concrete has its also its tactile qualities, it has texture, it has reflection. So when you treat it properly, you can create a cozy feeling and you can invoke quote unquote Japanese atmosphere, although you're using concrete. So then you have to think what are the qualities of the material and again, respect the material to create this tectonic uh, feel and in the end, the enjoyment of the guests. If we move away a little bit from architecture, then we can uh, think about, for instance, uh, what happens in public spaces. We were commissioned to do this uh, for Japanese local government. It's a, a town square. So this town square uh, has a couple of shelters where people can rest. Uh, there is also, uh, like during rainy season, they can just uh, chill there. And the interesting thing there is that this place, the old name of this place is Wood Country, uh, Tree Country, Kinukuni. But because Japanese law doesn't allow to use wood as structural material on uh, public infrastructure because it's burnable, we cannot use wood as structure. However, we wanted to respect uh, the past of the place and we really wanted to use large wood to kind of emphasize structure, to emphasize texture. And so we created these very massive panels which, have, which appear to be hanging from the ceiling of these of this shelters to create this feeling of uh, kind of this wooded uh, shelter, which is so rare actually in Japanese cities. And if you notice, those panels are very, very thick. So it doesn't make much sense for us to just hang in there as decoration because then it just creates unnecessary load on top of the structure and increases budget. It's uh, not safe. So actually what, we, what our structural engineer realized, and here we come to collaboration, our ideas come from other people. They realized that if we use this, make these panels out, out of individual beams and stack them together, then we press them on both sides. If we pre-stress them, they're going to start bending up. If they start bending up, they're actually going to defy gravity and they're going to start supporting the steel structure above. But they still can uh, are legal and they're safe because they're not main structure. 
So basically our ceiling now becomes secondary structure and also becomes our conceptual expression. And then we kind of enrich the space which has this wood history. Although the law says you cannot use wood. And so when we uh, made it, we were thinking what to do with the bolts on the bolt on both sides of the panel, because we have to hide them. And then the more we work, the more we realize that actually we shouldn't hide them because it's an interesting detail to show people how the ceiling works. And uh, also, uh, recently I read something that science actually has uh, conducted some studies that when people re uh, understand to some extent how buildings work, they enjoy spaces more because their brain rewards them for finding out things. So in a in trying to hide some bungan, to hide joints, to make everything perfect, I think it's much more valuable to find a way to explain to people how our buildings work rather than have perfect surfaces. And then another uh, public space that we did uh, this time a little bit private is a renovation of a, a plaza for a high school in Japan. This high school was founded by one of Japan's main industrialists 100 years ago, and they wanted to honor his statue with a new structure uh, for the 100th uh, anniversary of the of the place. So what we did is there was the existing statue of this guy, the, the green statue here on the hill. We decided that we are going to create a ring around it. And when you walk on this ring, you're going to read the, the story of this person's life. But how to make this addition? What kind of uh, material should we use? Turns out, that one of the companies that this person uh, founded 100 years ago, nowadays makes an ultra high strength special concrete, which can make very thin surfaces. So when we, uh, the company gladly uh, helped us with this material and we were able to create this very, very thin uh, structure, actually only three centimeters at the edge without any reinforcement inside in order to create this addition to the, this contemporary addition to this statue. And in a way, this also is very interesting because his legacy, his actual uh, work 100 years ago is informing our contemporary design. So it's not a random choice of material. And the way we choose this material is also because we want to create this uh, kind of uh, story structure. So again, the external factors are informing our idea instead of us just making a sketch and saying that's what it is. And uh, for instance, this is an, uh, going a little bit more towards interior, towards renovation. So I thought it's a very interesting conversation to have what is tectonic in terms of interiors, right? Because forces don't really flow there. There is it's, it's just a quote unquote decoration. But for instance, in this uh, project that we did in uh, one of Japan's villages, we made a kind of a small laboratory for community research inside of a hundred year old warehouse. And so how did we arrive at this architecture? Firstly, again, budget. People said we don't have budget, that's a university project, do it cheaply. Second, one of the most important things when you do renovation in Japan is earthquake resistance. So we have to provide earthquake stability for this first. So our budget is gonna go there. So we need to think about how do we create interior while we still actually respect all of the earthquake requirements. And if you look at these um, uh, walls, this plywood, there's like a, this is a kind of a high pressure cement board. These ones are actually earthquake resistant. In Japan, if you clad your building on the inside, wooden building with a specific grade of plywood, your building is going to become earthquake resistant. So actually what we did is we just used the structure to become interior by just choosing properly what kind of structure, what kind of texture the structure can have. So it can uh, uh, actually blend with the historic building. You can see here the existing old wall, the existing structure. But at the same time, we provide the most lean, the most cost efficient way to create this kind of a blend of traditional and contemporary space. And then just across the street of this project, there is a cafe in an old house. And then exactly the same thing. 
all of those gray walls that you see are new. Everything else is old. So the gray walls, they are structured. They are the earthquake resistance walls. They arranged our layout. So that's how, so earthquake tells us how the layout is going to be. It tells us what is going to be the material. And then what we do is we just pay very close attention to joinery, to detailing. So for instance, you can see here how contemporary material is meeting the traditional one. And then when we get to there, the architecture kind of arises by itself, by its conditions, rather than by only by our idea. And then we come here to Indonesia for a little bit. Uh, we are working on a couple of projects here, and we have a couple of finished ones already. One of them is uh, Kurasu Kyoto here in Jakarta, in Senopati Street. And this one was very interesting because it's a Japanese brand. They come to Indonesia and they say, um, we want to see what is going to be Kurasu in Indonesia. How do we interpret uh, whatever is our brand, whatever is our aesthetic with whatever exists in Indonesia? But at the same time, to some extent, you need to say, hey, this brand is from Japan. So then I thought one very important thing is we need to create a space which has substance, which feels solid, which feels, uh, for lack of a better word, tectonic, that doesn't feel just like an artificial interior. So that's why we decided to incorporate andesite stone, which is local to here, and it's actually all over the street in front of it for the first level of the interior. So it can create this idea that we are part of the uh, existing uh, cityscape. And then because the space is very weird, the, the space is quite strange. It is very tall. Basically, it's square. It's a cube. I always thought in my opinion, in my kind of foreigner opinion in Japan, I guess, that I always, when I go to traditional Japanese architecture, they always have this huge roof, exposed roof structure on top, which is completely dark and always so heavy, but at the same time feels so comfortable. So then we decided to just expose whatever exists in this old house in order to kind of evoke this feeling. And when we created the lighting, the lighting is very low. It's very kind of uh, subtle in, in order to create this, uh, to create space through the different layers of light, which I thought is an interesting way to interpret Japanese architecture. And that is also the way, uh, because of this kind of concept, our design was informed to look like that. It wasn't because the picture looks this way. And then this lamp has become very kind of a favorite topic of conversation to people recently. This lamp is made out of paper. And this uh, paper, when we were asked by the Japanese guys, hey, can't you do something with paper? I was thinking it's going to be nice to think about what are the properties of a paper material? And how can we uh, take, take them and use them without forcing the paper to be something else, to be a square, to be a cube, to be a circle? What are the, so paper can float, paper can, in, when it's suspended through the through the proper in the proper way, it can actually create its own structure. So, we actually uh, did a couple of mockups. We worked very closely with the contractors, craftsmen, to figure out what is the best way to use the properties of paper without any any extra structure. So here with Mas Ega, who is the actual person who made everything happen. Uh, we are actually developing a sewing method in order to take advantage of that. So again, paper and its properties are telling us what the design is going to be, rather than us sketching something and forcing paper to become something. That is kind of the like the, the tecton in architecton, right? The craftsman is very important to create something. And then uh, this is an interesting project that we did uh, recently for Arc ID last year. This, uh, we were asked to help with the creation of the food court of uh, Arc ID. And the interesting thing was that uh, I was thinking that the food court is a public space. And then when I was talking with uh, Ruth Slav and with BioLiving, who are our partners in this project, uh, it's very, very easily came to the idea that actually Ankringan should be the food court because Ankringan is actually a public space. It's a public space for people to unwind, to get together in place like Jakarta where there is not much public space. 
So we wanted to create just a place for people to hang out. That was the, that is the idea. The architecture has to be just a background, just a frame. So that's what it, because anchoring on is not an architecture that has to make a state. But we are on an architecture exhibition. So we have to say something. We have to say something about architecture. And when we were discussing with all our partners, our partners from Sapurna Kayu, I was uh, I remember the experiment that my colleagues back in Japan did once. They tried to make a roof out of one millimeter thick veneer, natural wood veneer. So together with uh, every, the whole team, we developed a system where we would uh, weave uh, uh, one millimeter veneers to become a two millimeter thick tent. And in that way, we wanted kind of to playfully show that wood, although it's a material which usually is made out, is using beams or columns, can become textile, can become a tent itself. And we are happy to say that actually this tent survived during the whole arc ID. It didn't survive completely when we roll it back, but well, this is an experiment. So the uh, here again, the place, the topic, the people, the team, the specific team told us what the architecture should be and not my sketch. And because we got very excited with this anchoring on idea and the working title was always strange, anchoring on, anchoring on Anne, together with, again, with Ruth Slap and Bayou Living, uh, and out, many other contributors, we are trying to create now Anchoring Anane 2.0. And again, we are thinking, how can a tent be reinterpreted? How can we create a tent that is different, that it creates, inspires people? And then how we decided to make this kind of many, many, many small planks tent is very easy. Actually, when we talk to Ruth Lab, who are the uh, kind of the, the the clients and the contractors of this thing, I asked them what kind of materials they have. And turns out they have like cubic meters and cubic meters of uh, rubber wood. So then I said, okay, then we're going to make a tent out of rubber wood. And because everyone in this uh, team is so adventurous, we actually start making it. And now we are at the stage where we created the full scale mock-up. And we are now uh, moving towards creating something larger. But basically, what we wanted to see is how can planks, how can planks of wood become textile? And uh, BioLiving, together with Rusab, created a system where we can have a normal wire mesh on top of a, a ranka, and on top we would have uh, woven planks. Those planks, they become actually kind of rafters, on, on top of which we plan to finish it with polycarbonate in order to create the kind of the waterproofing layer. So again, uh, it is availability of material, of the client, of those things that create architecture. And then just two more uh, short ones to show how perhaps tectonics can go to even smaller scale, to the artwork, to the, to the object even. So a couple of years ago, we were asked to participate in one of Japan's uh, big art festivals uh, in the mountains of Japan. And our topic together with, an, with a, a collective of designers was uh, karaoke. And karaoke in Japan is two, two, two things. One is you go sing karaoke in your booth, but the other one is there are those places called snack, snack bars where people go after work, they would have drinks, they would sing together with the bartender. And the interiors are always like red velvet, like gold. There's no, nothing like minimalist architecture. No, it's just like the most gaudy stuff. And it's so comfortable and cozy. So then you're thinking, how can we create architecture out of this? And another thing that they told us is like, you're going to make karaoke, but it should be soundproof. So how do you make a soundproof box that is appealing in a museum. So then we thought we should take this red velvet, which is kind of a very fluffy material, and we create panel wall panels in the shape of kind of these cushions, which evoke the very kind of absurd and gaudy interiors of these uh, uh, snack bars. And this is going to become our, our soundproofing, and it's going to become our facade. So people know what is inside. It's not just a black box. And then when you enter inside, this velvet becomes extremely apparent. So then 
we wanted to achieve really the kind of the almost quote unquote cheap and luxurious look of uh, such a bar. And then uh, we, we see that again, the conditions like sound and uh, culture, which is the snack bar culture, tell us what the architecture needs to be. And just by creating a system around these conditions, our shape becomes apparent. And then finally, uh, how do we create something tectonic in an ultra, ultra, ultra kind of retail environment? Um, one of this is Tokyo Station, and here in this area, we are tasked to do a very, very small bar slash artwork for one of the Japan's leading sake brands. And this bar actually is a very, very strange project. It's almost a tectonic. It's almost the opposite of tectonic because it's a, almost a pure artwork. But there was a, something interesting how we tried to imbue the client's identity in, inside of it. And this kind of, uh, we tried to express the most. So the bar itself before was a different bar, which was called construction site bar. So the bar was made out of scaffolding. But the client is a high-end sake, which is brewed in the mountains of Japan. So we decided, okay, we already have all this scaffolding. How can we make it feel like it's a forest? Uh, uh, let's just take whatever is there and use it. So we added like these construction sheets on top. We turned off the lighting to create this kind of very, very dim atmosphere. We almost forget there is a scaffolding. And then we decided we wanted to erase the architecture. Uh, so actually we propose to the client, let's not design architecture, let's make your glasses. Your glasses are going to be what we design. So we're going to make a black space and your glasses are going to glow. So when people enjoy, light is going to come from them. That was the original idea and the client was very excited. But when they started opening, they got a little bit freaked out to allow people to be in a completely black space. So they actually decided to turn, up, turn the lights up a little bit. But it was a very interesting thing how we started from architecture. And at some point, because of so much discussion with the client, so much thinking, we decided not to do architecture and actually do product design to honor better their brand. And then in conclusion, I wanted to share something that I cannot share the project yet, but I thought the approach is something that maybe we can discuss about. I thought that time is a very interesting idea in architecture. And I think that someone said that uh, architecture becomes architecture only after time passes. So for a project that you're working on now, we are thinking how, what if the, the architecture is made out of materials which are all of them old, which are allowed to be aged by nature, by time or artificially, and then put them together. And then on the first day of opening, this architecture already ha would, uh, would have these layers of time. And this is uh, important in this case because it's related to the brand that we are working with. So in a way, again, the brand is informing uh, our approach. And the shape just comes from the things that we have learned from the brand rather than from our sketch. So in conclusion, when I was thinking about this presentation and I was working to collect the things, I actually realized that one way to think about architecture, of course, there are so many and none of them is wrong, is uh, that architecture, an architectural object is an artwork arise, arising under various pressures and, which ex and why, while expressing those pressures in the actual form, this becomes tectonic. In a way, anything that influences the process, anything that influences the work, when it's expressed into the final work, in a way enriches it. And then in my opinion, this is what becomes tectonic. And then if we think about that, this is pressure, something pressuring an idea, compressing it and deforming it. Well, then maybe we can think about this metaphor where originally an idea is just a piece of coal. It's just, a, it's just formed and it's imperfect. But then when it's, uh, it's final form after everything has been considered, everything is to be taken into account, it becomes this diamond the solid thing that we have already created. And I will, I think, leave you here, guys. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm within my time, but that is uh, more or less all for me. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Mr. Van Batra, for the presentation. It's very interesting. Uh, hello, I think. Sorry. Oh, it's yeah. very interesting to dig into more tactics and architecture. And I also believe participants here who were a designer or architectural practice could be more aware that tactics are applied in various architecture fields. And this also answers your first question, what shapes architecture? Thank you once again, Mr. Svatlan Patrov. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Yeah. from. Yeah. No, no. Restart just my just your camera. Yeah, yeah. Just your I camera. Think, I think my computer froze. I'm so sorry. Just a moment, guys. Uh. Sorry, Mr. Pastrov, there is a technical issue, but let's on move to the question and answer or discussion yeah. session. Okay, we're glad to receive so many questions and due to time limitations, we're going to select the first three questions from for our speakers. Um, for the participants, feel free to ask through the chat column within the format name, underscore institution, underscore speaker, underscore question, or participants can unmute the mic if you are comfortable enough. The first question is from Arum Anggrani Pratiwi from Universitas Pancasila. The question is, how does the concept of techno, techno relate to the field of architecture and what impact has it had on the development of architectural theory and practice? Sorry, guys, I just uh, disappeared for a second. Oh, okay. It's okay. Okay. Um, the question is, how does the concept of techno relate to mm -hmm. the field of architecture and what impact has it had on the development of architectural theory and practice? Uh, this is to Pahari or to me? Um, I think for part of For you. Mr. Petrov. Oh, okay, really? Oh, wow. <laughs> that is a very academic question, guys. Uh, <laughs> um, I will answer from my limited experience and knowledge, yeah. And Pahari is going to help me, I think. So if I understand correctly, uh, it is about how tectonics has impacted architecture through time, right? Through through, through time, uh, through the history of architecture. Is that uh, correct? Is that correct, guys? Okay, I'll assume that is correct. Uh, so I think that uh, actually tectonics was not really a topic, I think, in architecture until the 19th century or something like that, because it was just the way people would be building. They, they would just build with the, whatever available materials there is, and then they would just do their thing, and then their buildings would become naturally quote-unquote tectonic because they're following some kind of uh, circumstances or like materials or techniques. But tectonics, I, in my opinion or in my knowledge, it becomes important when we have so much technology to create buildings. And that is the, after the industrial revolution. So in a way we have this kind of dilemma, do we build whatever we wanna build because we can do it? Or do we follow some kind of principles that are more kind of naturalistic? And I think that was rather an interesting intellectual discussion until modernism came. Because then we really focused on creating abstract spaces, abstract shapes. And then this kind of, for a while, then after the postmodernism, for a while we forgot about uh, where architecture is coming from or what is the, or architecture is a process. You're more thinking about architecture as an idea. And I think nowadays, because of the back, going back to sustain, uh, thinking about sustainability, sustainable architecture, local materials, we slowly those kind of limitations of, of what material is available. Is it good for the environment? Is it climate uh, appropriate? 
are coming back into architecture. And in a way, we are rediscovering a tectonic way of building, which ultimately I think is a great thing. Because in my opinion, actually, if, if you have to take one thing from tectonics is limitations are shaping something. And I think limitations, having limits is very good because then it uh, creates the exact core idea appropriate for this place, rather than having all the choice in the world and then just make, I don't know, ski resort in the desert, right? This is not very tectonic in a way. So I don't know if I answered the question, but that is kind of my take on how tectonics um, moved through time and how now it's coming back. Okay, thank you, Mrs. Fatun Petro, for the answer. Let's move on to the next question for Mr. Fatun Petro again. I'm really interested in the first museum building of your masterpiece. It is challenging to build in that limited size of Mara Square, and the context is cool to be explained more. Could you explain more details about it and what major did your team use in the design process of the museum? Ah, in the first one, right? The first yes. uh, design. Well, uh, maybe, yeah, uh, so the, this this place, this, uh, this uh, place is a very kind of special place because the building is located between a existing kind of uh, uh, part, complex of important buildings. And on the back is the mountain where actually this, uh, maybe I should share my screen very quickly because we can talk with pictures better. Yeah. So let me know if you're seeing it. Uh, so basically, the front of the place is, is uh, has a function like uh, buses need to be able to stop parking lot, whatever. But there is also this kind of traditional architecture in front. So that limits our site. And at the back, we are limited by the mountain. and. Actually, what is more interesting is that if you see this small picture down, the one with the stone road, this road is actually an artwork. It's a one kilometer long artwork, which cannot be touched. So our building basically needs to be very, very narrow and very, very long. And at the same time, it needs to have its uh, character. It needs to also be subtle. So many contradictions there. So all of those things actually informed our design. And one another, another thing that you had to do is the landscape designer was doing this kind of uh, a very interesting uh, kind of terrace landscape related to traditional methods of building. So our building had to be a continuation of the landscape without being landscape. So the this roof's uh, incline is actually very similar to the incline of this terrain. So it can create this idea that the building is emerging from the landscape and you're not disrupting uh, so much the existing environment. Um, and another thing was that uh, we were working with a very limited palette of materials because of uh, function, because of budget. So the whole of uh, uh, building is a concrete box. And then we have uh, just simple roof on top. So we are thinking, how can we create an interesting architecture only with these two limited things? And in the end, always it comes back to proper proportioning and proper detailing, and of course, choice of the proper uh, kind of connections and the proper material. That is more or less, I think. Uh, it's a very humble, humble small building in Japan. Okay, thank you, Mrs. Valen Patrol. Another question for Mr. Svalen Patrol and also Pahari. In what ways can the manipulation of space through tectonics enhance user interaction, navigation, and overall convert within a building? Pahari first, maybe this time. Okay. Uh, which one? How tectonics in architect can provide structure support to a building so that it becomes stiff? How does it work and can be applied in multi-story building? Yeah, okay. ini Pak Yuliani dari Universitas Pancasila. Oh, Yuliani mana? Okay. In what? Yeah. Okay. Uh, mungkin ini sama dengan yang di bawahnya kali ya. Si siapa nih? Uh, tadi dari Bumcas Teknologi Jogja. 
can provide uh, structure support to a building so that it becomes stiff. Uh, yeah, manipulasi dan manipulasi dari space uh, tadi kalau yang uh, pengalaman yang tadi saya kasih lihat bahwa bangunan joglo walaupun saya cuma sepintas joglo yang kecil ternyata uh, memanipulasi strukturnya dengan cara saling tumpuk ya saling tumpuk saling silang uh, kemudian uh, mungkin teknik sambungan yang tidak sesimpel yang uh, teknik sambungnya simpel bentuk se uh, sambungnya simpel tapi ketika dia ditumpuk dan di, di apa diolah uh, jadi lebih mungkin bisa lihat di di mana ya Ini saya kumpulkan pertanyaannya. Nah, ini kali ya. Nah, uh, ini terlihat ya. Nah, ini ini uh, kalau kalau kita kenal cuma istilah jantan dan betina, ternyata di uh, mungkin gimana cara ngomongnya ya. Jadi uh, selama ini kan kita selalu menjenderkan si si struktur ini gitu bahwa ada jantan dan betina. Tapi ketika saya melihat teknik sambungannya, ternyata Enggak cuma begitu, di jantan ada di betina, di betina ada jantannya. gitu Jadi mungkin kalau balik ke teori arsitektur, order and disorder itu ada di sini. gitu Jadi uh, ketika dia, uh, mungkin agak korek-korek dikit kali ya, biar agak gimana gitu. Jadi ketika membuat, selama ini kita menganggap uh, yang, yang, yang betina itu pasti ada sebuah lubang gitu ya, Nah, ini lubang, kemudian yang jantan eh, posisinya akan masuk ke dalam eh, lubang yang betina tersebut. Sehingga ini disebut jantan, ini disebut sebagai betina. Tapi ternyata ada di sebuah kondisi bahwa di jantan ini juga ada betinanya, ada lubang juga. Nah, ini yang yang kemudian ternyata nanti di sini ketika ketika si jantan itu masuk, kemudian nanti ada pasak lagi yang sangat lebih konkret dia akan masuk ke dalam uh, ini. Nah, sehingga manipulasi ruangnya jadi juga sangat unik karena kita bisa melihat bahwa ini akan jadi ini masih space nya sangat uh, pendek ya, oh, pendek banget gitu sehingga sehingga uh, ini uh, apa uh, bentangnya ya bentang dari struktur yang paling dalam ke struktur yang paling luar tuh ini masih sangat uh, pendek itu sekitar satu meter itu. Tapi kalau kita lihat joglo yang lebih uh, komplit, yang lebih sempurna, itu bisa aja dia sampai bentang yang sangat jauh karena ini saling mengikatnya ini. Uh, Oke, okay, kemudian uh, tadi uh, pertanyaan lebih lanjut. Tadi dari Yulia ya. Terus yang selanjutnya, uh, how digital aspect influence new definition of architectonic? How Indonesian vernacular architecture can be developed with digital aspect? Oh, ini, ini ini lumayan berat. Mungkin ada gimana sih? Karena uh, di pengertian digital aspect ini gimana ya? Digital itu kan um, digital itu itu kalau kita ikutin ini saya coba copy dulu ya digital aspect mohon maaf Nicole sorry Nicole is there any Nicole Nicole here iya yeah, pak ya yeah. uh, meaning dari uh, Uh, apa uh, meaning dari si uh, digital ini gimana nih pengertian digital tuh gimana nih uh, yang dimaksud dengan digital uh, biar biar kita bisa paham dulu sebentar ini kalau boleh mungkin digital suara saya ya suara saya kedengaran nggak ya kedengar dengar oke okay. mungkin uh, digital yang ada di pikiran saya kan sekarang uh, mungkin udah lebih ke Contohnya misalnya prefabrikasi, terus oh, okay. ada misalnya okay. udah mulai masuk yang rhino grasshopper kayak 
Iya. Kreatif betul. desain masih luas sih maksud saya. Iya iya ya, berarti. Iya 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 berarti hampir se- uh, paling sederhananya mungkin bahasa gampangnya parametrik arsitektur kali ya bahasa paling gampangnya ya. Iya. 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 Ya. Gimana biar tektonika Indonesia tuh tetap nggak uh, nggak hilang gitu? Soalnya Baik. kan kita sebagai mahasiswa juga kalau tektonik kan ngelihat aspek waktunya, sedangkan Baik. di zaman sekarang kita uh, digital kan sangat mendominasi ya. Gimana Betul. kita mahasiswa arsitektur ini bisa mengimplementasikan ke proyek-proyek itu? Baik, oke okay. terima kasih. Uh, nanti mungkin sekalian lagi sekali lagi in English to Mr. Petrov ya. It's okay ya. Yeah. It's I understand. Okay. I understand what ah, yeah. said. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. I, I think it's you're... a great. I think it's a great ah. question, though. Ya, yeah. uh, mungkin saya tarik sedikit ya, Nicole, ke ke titik yang paling uh, sederhana. Ketika batik, uh, kita kita orang Indonesia tahu batik kan ya. Kemudian batik tersebut di digital. Kemudian ada satu, saya lupa namanya. Uh, ada pecinta batik. Kemudian dia ingin merekam batik tersebut dalam bentuk digital. Digital itu kan sebenarnya uh, balik lagi digital itu apa sih? Digital itu kalau saya kan digital itu kan uh, dua uh, cuma dua angka ya kosong dan satu kan. Ya balik kayak tadi uh, tektonikanya apa ya uh, jantan betina lagi gitu. Jadi uh, teknik sambungan kan tadi saya bilang sebenarnya teknik sambungan itu cuma jantan dan betina tapi ketika di saya pelajari ketika saya belajar lah belajar saya ketika saya belajar di dikasih pengetahuan oleh teman saya oh enggak ternyata di dalam jantan ada betina ada ini nah jadi kalau digital uh, arsitektur di tektonik ya kalau memang baliknya adalah uh, dalam bentuk si siapa tadi uh, kalau dari sisi uh, apa nih uh, software tadi nyebut grasshopper ya sini nanti mungkin ada yang bisa bantu uh, satu kita undang nanti mas Herbayu ya mas Bayu bisa bantu jawab juga tuh Yeah, Petrov, yeah. Yeah. Uh, if, if I can just add something to yeah. what uh, Bahari is saying. Uh, okay. Thank you, Nicole, for this question. I think it's very important because I, I've uh, done my experiments in Grasshopper before and Rhino. And I think, because I think you, you, uh, Nicole said that uh, how do we use digital so the tectonics of Indonesian architecture doesn't get uh, disappeared, right? Doesn't disappear. So I think the danger of uh, parametric architecture is, again, because you can make any shape, shapes become meaningless because you can just make any shape and then it's just it's just a shape. Uh, but in the end, uh, what is uh, Japanese architecture, what's Indonesian architecture, what is uh, Bulgarian architecture? In its essence, it's what are the available materials in this place, right? So if uh Indonesian architecture in certain a uh, place is based on bamboo or is based on say jati or is based on ulin or whatever or like stone grasshopper is just a tool uh, that can allow you to do any shape any calculation anything so basically if you if you plug in the the kind of say in the uh, the, the material properties that are for this material from this part of java for instance into grasshopper the shape is going to become something unique for that place because only there, uh, for instance, the sambungan is this way, right? So only there you're using this type of bamboo. So it's important what kind of uh, variables we put in grasshopper in order to create architecture and not just start from grasshopper as a, a, f- a form creation tool. So as long as your variables, your starting point is local, that means your digital uh, thing is going to be also local. Uh, I mean, to, to some extent, uh, for instance, Ibu Kubali are doing that, right? They're basically reinterpreting bamboo, which is there, to something contemporary. And then another thing is, digital doesn't need to be more, uh, form-making. When you said prefabrication, I think that's very important. Because in Japan, for instance, a lot of uh, their wood buildings, which are everyday buildings, they're made out with CNC machines. So they just make the joints and then people just put them on site and then they connect them. So in a way, they must produce what was before carpentry. And in a way, that, that was never lost. 
So is, is mass production good or bad is a different question, but uh, digital technology in that case is not a creativity tool, it's a production tool. So we have to use digital 100% for everything because this is that's what it is. But it's important to think about it that the creativity still is within the person and within the culture. And uh, and that is what it creates the shape. Otherwise, and grasshopper is the same as a hammer. It has it's absolutely the same thing. A hammer and a grasshopper is the same thing. It a lot. So it's just a matter of the architect if this is going if it's gonna be lost the Indonesian identity or not. Yeah, great question. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Fatman Patra, for the answer. But moving back to the previous question to Mrs. Fatman Patra, um, in what ways can the manipulation of space through tectonics enhance user interaction, navigation, and overall comfort within a building? Uh, so I think this is really important, especially, especially in commercial architecture as well, because there... Uh, we need to make sure that we're creating comfortable space that is not just relying on, I don't know, brand identity or whatever. So I think that in public space, especially, so they're not just like, they're places where people have to feel comfortable. And I think um, one important thing is very careful selection of textures and materials because uh, uh, research shows that when we look at a texture, when you look at the material, a certain parts of the brain actually are simulating how this material is going to feel. So it's not just about uh, uh, color or like just looking nice. Actually, when you make something out of wood, when you stay in this room, your brain actually feels different. If you stay in a room with uh, a stone, it feels different. So th th those materials usually are a big part of creating atmosphere and space. So very careful selection and like the associated uh, things with like stone is cold, wood is warm, blah, blah, blah. Those things need to be taken into account. And then, as I mentioned earlier, actually joinery and, and connections between materials are very, very important because uh, this usually we architects are just concerned, is this rapi or is it not rapi, right? But actually, it's or is it like, perfectly straight or not, but it's more than that. I think a joinery and it's also uh, in more complex uh, meaning when Pa Hari is talking about the Sambungan of uh, the wood, they really show how your design works. They kind of separate your uh, your space, they, they create scale. All of those things affect how people uh, interact with the space. And also, it actually affects how they enjoy it. Because really, if people can find more things to look at and to touch, they would be happier rather than in a completely empty, perfect white box, for instance. OK, thank you, Mr. Fatlin Petrov, for the answer. Um, let's move on to the next question. For Mr. Hari and also Mr. Fatlin Petrov, too. From Glenn, from Universitas Teknologi Yogyakarta. How tectonics in architecture can provide structural support to a building so that it becomes stiff? How does it work? And can it be applied in multi-story buildings? Mungkin Pak Ari, dipersilakan untuk jawab dulu, Pak. Oke. Stiff itu kan berarti tentang kekakuan ya. Memang kalau begitu masuk ke... Ketika udah high-rise building, kita sudah tahu bahwa uh, biasanya itu sudah memakai uh, struktur yang lebih kuat, yang lebih uh, ini. Tapi, nah ini juga uh, belakangan ini, uh, saya dan beberapa teman mencoba untuk uh, berbicara bagaimana jika kayu kembali digunakan sebagai bangunan tinggi. Nah, jadi, teknik sambungannya itu uh, seperti apa lagi. Memang uh, beberapa... Saya sempat di tahun ketika awal-awal COVID itu uh, almarhum ketua IAI waktu itu Pak Umum IAI Mas Juju juga sempat menyatakan itu bahwa bagaimana kalau kita kembali ke kayu untuk menggunakan uh, high rise building dan itu memungkinkan selama selama balik lagi teknologinya diperbaiki dan 
uh, pengertian diperbaiki adalah uh, bukan cuma sambungan yang sangat simpel lagi karena sudah sudah sampai ke uh, ya sudah sampai yang lebih unik lah kata beliau gitu ya. Nah uh, belakangan ternyata itu jadi pembicaraan kembali ketika uh, saya ada di ya sedang ngobrol ini semua banyak ke arah pembicaraan apa ngobrol-ngobrol gitu aja ya. Akhirnya memang uh, ada keinginan untuk kembali menggunakan kayu. Karena kalau kita lihat di kalau misalnya kita lihat di di Amerika atau apa mereka ternyata banyak masih menggunakan rumah kayu sementara kita sudah pakai menggunakan uh, batu gitu ya, apa uh, bata. Tapi uh, ternyata industri kayunya yang memang mereka bisa menyiapkan Jadi waktu itu ada pembicaraan juga bahwa supply and demand saya cukup menarik dari situ. Tapi kalau masalah ketinggian mungkin ya harus di, di apa di dikembalikan lagi ke teknologinya. Kita siapkan mungkin bisa jika memang harus membutuhkan kayu yang harus lebih besar sebagai sebuah soko gurunya atau uh, tiang utamanya ya. berarti ukuran ukuran kayu yang eh, mungkin diameter sudah gigantik atau mungkin bisa sampai eh, 80 cm harus kita siapkan dan saya yakin bisa aja ya oke terima kasih uh, if I can just add a little bit um, I I think actually there is a kind of a two topics here because one is uh, providing stiffness to a building or maybe high rise building this is more like a structural structural issue but i feel the tectonic issue more is how does architecture how the architectural image is going to deal with this structure because if you have to have a very tall high rise building that means you're going to have a lot of structure stiffeners a uh, big columns whatever So then how does the architectural image of this building become uh ex- expresses this structure and does it need to express it so i always uh, think uh the tectonics is more like a kind of the way we translate things into architecture rather than like a method for building because the building method after it's being expressed become tectonic i mean at least in my understanding and I'm not an expert but yeah that's just my uh addition thank you mr hari and mr svatan patrov okay move on to another question for mr svatan patrov I have always been interested in Japanese architecture due to the modern technology or the level of efficiency they had, like performance, quality control, and many more. Knowing that Indonesia and Japan are somehow similar, for example, about the earthquake matters or the narrowing lands, may I ask what are the things that, that can be implemented to Indonesia with Japanese technology and architecture since Indonesia architecture haven't reached its maximum capacity and haven't fully developed it yet? Oh, thank you for this uh, very detailed question. <laughs> um, so... Yeah, uh, it, as Paraha he said earlier, uh, Japan and Indonesia are both in the ring of fire. So uh, we, we do have similar uh, problems in both countries. I, I would uh, think so. And I, I guess one thing that can be, I, I don't I don't dare to, to suggest policy changes or whatever, because I'm not that kind of expert. But uh, I, I guess one thing that has to be really thought over when designing is uh, the level of safety that we that we need. Because, um, you know, disasters can ha- need to happen only once. They need to happen in a big scale only one time. They, they might not happen for like 100 years. And then when they happen one time, something bad is going to happen. So I guess what Japan does well uh, is they really prepare. They really prepare for things that are going to happen in the future. And that, of course, uh, immediately affects their lawmaking and the way uh, their design looks like. Because the way Japanese architecture looks like often is because of its conditions of these extreme earthquakes. 
So I guess I'll, uh, if we put some some a big uh, part of emphasis during design and construction on safety, uh, on safe on future safety, that means that we will actually have uh, first we're gonna prepare for something, but the architecture itself is going to change because now we have a new condition. So I guess that is actually not only Indonesia. That is what Bulgaria has to do. That is where what uh, ma many countries have to do, uh, I think. But this is just uh, kind of one thing that I, it comes to my mind. But every uh, construction industry is very, very different. So it's a little bit difficult to say, ah, oh, we can just take that from Japan and it's gonna work. Or this is gonna take that from England and it's gonna work. In the past, people tried to do that and it never worked out. It's kind of construction industries are rooted into culture, into local materials, into local ways of building. So I guess kind of every industry needs to get to a certain place by itself in order to be most efficient for its own people, I think. But I think maybe Bahari also can uh, has an opinion on that. Thing is enough for you, uh, from you, sir. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, next, uh, maybe uh, from Audi, uh, Fatma, please. Okay. Uh, last questions for Mr. Pastro. Uh, before that, I wanted to, to say I admire all your work, especially that handmade lighting in Kurasu. Meanwhile, I was wondering what is the difference between stereotomic and tectonic architecture? I was very afraid of this question because to be honest, I don't know the difference. <laughs> maybe, maybe Bang Hari can help me with this. I also don't know what to say. <laughs> let's yeah, let's uh, do the it's, homework, yeah. Yeah, it's uh yeah, because uh sorry, uh this is very, very uh Maybe philosophical or maybe technical or Metro? academical, yeah, or, or academical. And yeah. uh, from my side, is wow, it's so deep. Uh, I love the questions here, man. Yeah, it's, so it's a big, good. That's very good yeah. questions. M maybe so Audi, uh, yeah, maybe Audi can uh, can explain uh, why you ask this. Audi is there, still there. Audi. Oh, wow. Even oh, the internet is, huh? is difficult to read. Guys, I need to okay. put this question for homework. <laughs> yeah, me too. Uh, selama uh, ketika sedang uh, ini berjalan, uh, Petrov, uh, I'm Googling. I do a Google. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> what is stereotomic? Uh, what? Stereotomic and... Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Stereotomic and... Blah blah blah, stereotomic and uh, stereotomic, stereotomics and tectonic architecture. But yeah, I don't have any experience with this. Uh, no, I but I literally heard it today, so I think that's something for the next webinar for sure. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I'm so sorry we couldn't answer. I'm so sorry. Uh, yeah, <laughs> sorry, I'll be... uh, Too little reading, too little reading. Yeah, we must, uh, yeah, we must prepare more than today. Uh, so, better off. So. Okay, next. Okay, it's okay. It's okay. Um, we still have time for mm -hmm. one last question. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, it's for Mr. Petrov. Um, is tectonics always prioritized tactility, or can it start with other senses first, other than tactile sense, like for example, odor, vibration, and etc.? Are there any good example of such project for that? Mm -hmm. um, 
I think that's a great question too. Uh, uh, just to to make clear uh, what I was presenting today is kind of uh, my interpretation of tectonics. I'm pretty sure that there are many ways to interpret the issue, um, but I always felt that uh, yeah, uh, we can think beyond texture for architecture because in any case, our um, the, the way we perceive spaces is through all of our senses. So it's a little bit of a misconception that architecture is a visual art. Maybe that is because of photography or Instagram, but actually architecture, everybody who knows is that if you see a picture of a building and then you go to a place, it's a totally different thing. Uh, some buildings cannot be photographed for that reason because sound is different there, smell is different there, air flows differently vibration i thought that's an amazing idea i need to think about that one but uh yeah uh i really think that when you are trying to create architecture uh, one needs to think about the all of the senses so what people think what kind of temperature people are going to be feeling what kind of smell is it they're going to be for instance very interestingly if you have been to a, a building which is made out of pine it smells very distinctly. It smells, uh, uh, the first days when you build it, it smells really, really intense. And I think that this is so unique. So when you go to some certain timber buildings, it smells differently. And then that contributes to your feeling of, I don't know, being in a cabin or feeling warm or something like that. And actually things like smell or temperature shouldn't be ignored because Actually, smell is one of the senses which creates most memories in our brain. If you think about it, uh, your like, you know, your grandma's cookies or like sweets from when you were little, even if it was 50 years ago, you can still smell them. That's because you remember it. So once you smell something, you cannot forget it. And I think this is a very interesting thing to, to think when you're designing. If you're designing with earth, it's going to smell like earth. So this is something to know and perhaps use in the space. Thank you, Mr. Fatlov, once again. Um, but thank you, Mr. Hari and Mrs. Falpatro for answering such questions for our participants. Um, I believe they are curious enough to learn more about technics and wanted to apply in the architecture and construction field. But due to limited time, we need to end our discussion session. Okay, next there will be a group photo session and plug giving with the participants, which will be guided by the technician team. All participants are requested to activate the camera. Okay, one. Once again, all participants are requested to activate the camera. Is the technician ready? Okay, I see all participants already activated the camera. Uh, for technician, could you please help us to take pictures? Okay, everyone, in one, two, three, pose. Okay. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for activating the camera. Um, and also for our participants, don't forget to fill uh, the absence link that already provided in the comment section. Thank you, everyone. Thank um, you very much. Also, please allow me to take some highlighted points from today's session. From the first speaker, it tells much about the material at the beginning of the tectonic in architecture. For instance, is bamboo tree, a hot construction with run from, and it was adjusted to the environmental condition. Subsequently,
Mr. Harimau Frizen also mentioned about organ covering ulu, which is more complex because of its capability to create public space. This is also correlated with Indonesian architectural building. In Indonesia, Rumah Panggung is pretty famous because of its building mass can be seen from the outside of the building, and most of Rumah Panggung use a concrete material. And next from the second speaker, the first question is what shapes architecture? Tectonic architecture is the thing that shape architecture and can be seen in our architectural and also construction practice. Tectonic is an expression of construction and materials and also architects have the role to think about how the design will be executed. Tectonic is not only about aesthetics, but it is an approach of an architect's idea to objects or also buildings. And also Mr. Svatun Petrov mentioned it from his several projects like Uchikada Building, Wakayama City Station Square, Kawazu Lab, and Kurasu that also can be visited in Jakarta. And things to be more concerned about when doing a renovation of the building in Japan is earthquake resistance and also it's similar to Indonesia and uh, most of Indonesian building. And the highlighted is craftsmen is very important in architecture to create something. Okay. Um, we have gone through event after event together. We also have gained a lot of useful knowledge uh, thank you, Mr. Spatlin, and also Mr. Harimo Frizon. Thank you. thank you. Thank you. And also, thank you for all the participants and enthusiasm. Uh, because of this enthusiasm, this webinar event felt exceptional. And also, we would like to thank the Roman Ceramics for providing financial support for this event. I, Fatma Tinda Putri, as today's Master of Ceremony and represent the committee in charge, yeah. apologize for any wrong and risks and also actions. Remember to follow our Instagram at Komunitas Literasi. See you at the next event and thank you very much. Selamat sore. Thank you. Selamat sore. Inspirasi dan imajinasi tanpa batas. Bersama Roman, wujudkan imajinasi menjadi kenyataan. Kami bangga menemani perjalananmu, menciptakan sebuah asa menjadi karya, sebuah sketsa menjadi kenyataan, sebuah harapan menjadi senyuman. Berimajinasilah tanpa batas hingga kamu menemukan siapa dirimu. Roman, imagine what you and Roman can do.
Halo. Oh, Mr. Petrov sudah menghilangkah? Udah, Pak. Iya, udah nggak ada, Pak. Oh, ya sudah. Mungkin tadi ada, karena sudah di... Oh, feel free to leave. So, I feel free to leave too. Sebentar, Pak. Kita nggak jadi lempar-lemparan ya. Sorry. Remove background-nya. Eh, salah ya. Salah posisi. Mana? Gue kira lu mau bilang remove Pak Hari. Di pin up dulu kali. Nah, udah. Bukan ke lu. Bukan ke lu. Bukan ke lu. Kembali, Pak. Kembali, Pak. Kembali, Pak. Mending di pin 2 kali. Nah, terus ya. pertanyaan terbaiknya nggak diumumkan? Halo? Besok, Pak, katanya, Pak. Oh. Pada di mute mute ngomong pada di mute mute gimana sih? Ya, kalau di... ya. Ini, ini pada di sana semua ya. Coba foto situasi kalian lah. Aduh, gue jadi... Bapak sih nggak datang. Tau, bapak sih nggak datang. Tapi dari sisi pertanyaan kayaknya yang menarik tuh si siapa ya si anak-anak oh, itu ya. juga terlalu ui sih kalau menurut gue. Ya. Belum dong. Gimana? Belum nggak di foto ya? Lagi di foto. Ini. Oh, gelap banget ya ini ya. Pak, berarti Pak, berapa? Yang pun penuh. Penuh Pak, mungkin bapak kamu datang juga. Ya untung, untung gue nggak di situ. Kalau gue situ penuh juga dong. Masih apa? Masih masih ada satu bangku kosong Pak. Oh, oh iya. 